Right. Uh, well, thank you, Daniel, for your time. Thank you. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I thought it'd be great to to have a conversation, ask you a bit about your your work, the EPRC, uh, and your writings as well. Um, so let's get into it. Um, so tell me a bit about your your background. I I know you through the EPRC and through your work on meditation. Um, did, you what was you what was or is your career uh, before all that? So before all that, well, I tend to talk about the three Daniels when I do this, which involves career. So Daniel number one is this kid who started having meditative experiences when he was very young, could get into blissful, peaceful states, and then started having lucid flying dreams at around age five, and then took a weird meditation course in fourth grade in a hippie Quaker school I went to, Carolina Friends School in Durham, North Carolina, when I was around 10, and then had his first massive energetic explosion of consciousness at around age 14 or 15 while meditating, trying to have more lucid flying dreams and then start having all kinds of weird and then travel out of body for the first time, the classic, you know, lift out, see your body there, float through the wall, freak out, snap back, paralysis and buzz. And what the heck was that? Uh, and then started having all kinds of weird stuff happen to me over the next 10 years that I didn't know what it was. And then ran into some people who had gone on intensive meditation retreats, started going on very intensive meditation retreats, and then found the maps and all the manuals of meditation of how to do this stuff, how to make sense of it, how to do something useful with it, became totally obsessed with that and basically trained to become a meditative athlete. And then ended up writing a book founding an online community and hanging out a, a shingle that said, basically, if you're having weird meditative, energetic, psychedelic experiences, I will talk to you about those for free. I won't even take a donation. When you can do that, you get to talk to thousands of people about their fascinating highs, lows, weirds, and adventures in the spiritual, psychedelic, energetic, mystical, magical, spontaneous, et cetera, paths. And then I became something of an accidental expert with a fascinating friend circle. So that's Daniel number one. Daniel number two was like North Carolina School of Science and Math and then pre-med and electrical engineering and then public health school, epidemiology, infectious disease, a lot of biostatistics, stuff like that. And then MD and then emergency medicine and eventually healthcare administration doing you know metrics and business and process improvements and numbers and all that stuff. And Daniel number two was basically taught that Daniel number one either didn't exist and or was crazy and needed meds. Right, which was I don't think was true. And I should mention about Daniel number one. Daniel number one was very luckily lucky in that he had the good sense not to tell his Harvard, Yale, Yale, Harvard educated pediatrician father what was going on with him, because my dad now admits he would have done something really stupid had I said that. And is super glad I kept my mouth shut because he would have not known how to do something helpful and instead admits he would have done something harmful and thought I was crazy had I talked about all those things. Mm. So that's Daniel number two. Um, and then Daniel number three began to emerge about four years ago when Dr. Julieta Galante said, hey, why don't you come to Cambridge and spend the summer with me trying to research the stages of insight and, and figure out how we can be the change we want to see in the world. It is the height of ridiculousness that with double doctoral degrees in a in a you know department of psychiatry at Cambridge University that I can't talk about my most personally, psychologically and you know transformative and also sometimes challenging experiences. This is what so, Julieta said. This is, yeah, Julieta Galante. And so yeah. then this fascinating friend circle that I acquired uh, along the way with people, you know, um, through talking to people about this stuff, were like, hey, what are you doing with your summer? And I'm like, oh, this thing with Julieta. And they're like, where do we sign? And before we knew it, we were the EPRC. And I was the retired guy with some resources. And they all had like lives and kids and jobs and stuff. And so I ended up the sort of de facto administrator of this thing. Well, and then we built the charity Emergence Benefactors because we realized we needed something incorporated that could be a bank and aggregate funds and administer grants, such as for your excellent project, um, the Coming Home Challenging Psychedelic Experiences Study. So, and here we are today talking. So that's the, the very, it, sorry if that was a long story, but that at least then gives you a sense of the impetus and the background for this. Yeah, no, that was a really good, quick encapsulation of something you probably had stole a few times. I really appreciate that. I mean, just uh, interesting that it started off at a Quaker school. I mean, because because Quakers is this kind of existing remnant of a contemplative tradition in Western Christianity, but there's really not much in the way of maps or guides there. You're kind of just sitting there and things can happen, right? Mm -hmm. And they did. Yeah. 
Yeah. And they did. Yeah. Why do you think your dad would have thought you were crazy from the experiences? I mean, like, what, because of things like the out of body stuff? Yeah. Or say my consciousness was exploding or I was perceiving energy or any of that stuff. He would have, you know, my, my father is a fascinating individual. He's brilliant. He's super kind. He means really well. He is a fascinating, but he was like, you know, an engineer from like the 50s with like the slide rules and pocket protectors at Harvard. He has a mm -hmm. side of him that is incredibly muggly and materialist, right? Mm, yeah. But if you start, and, and so then he's very much like very nervous about anything woo-woo or weird. And on the uh -huh. other hand, if you talk to him, he has seen ghosts and like has all these fascinating ghost stories from his childhood and even adult life and related to his mom and where the house they grew up in, which was known to have a ghost. And so like, he's a very fast, and a lot of people are like this. They, on the one hand, may be this way. And then if you really talk to them about what they've experienced and another part of them knows, they may have compartmentalized it off. And my dad is one of those people, but he would have been very freaked out at me having strange experiences, probably would have gotten some neurological evaluation, put me on some kind of meds, thought I was psychotic. It, it would have, the, the materialist side of him would have been super uncomfortable with that. So the, I mean, the tradition that you, you, you see uh, from, from reading your mastering the core teachings of the Buddha, obviously um, you got very into Buddhist traditions. Can you just tell me a bit about that? Yeah, well, not only Buddhist, but a lot of other stuff. There's a lot of influences in those books that are non-Buddhist. There's magical influences, Hindu influences, Christian, mystical, and Sufi influences, non-aligned indigenous influences. There's stuff in there that comes out of, you know, a wide range of fascinating sources across millennia and a lot of different languages and backgrounds, right? So as I mentioned in the forward and warning, but it, it was for me, and I'm not saying this is the right path necessarily for anybody, but what really sparked me is when I, I ran into insight retreats, you know, started right. going, I did my first insight retreat at IMS with Chris Pertitnis and Charter Rogel and Jose Rezig. And it just made a lot of sense. If you want to understand your experience, pay more attention to your experience, things come and go. You can notice that, that you can make your mind more precise and clear. And what was interesting is every time I would go on one of these retreats, this set of experiences that I didn't really understand how they had happened would happen on the retreat, you know, compressed into nine or 17 or 27 days or whatever it was in, in a way that would mirror what had happened during the previous 25, six years of my life, just super like, okay, it's all happening and in the right order, but it's just really much faster. And I started having these same kinds of experiences very reproducibly on retreat. I was like, that's interesting. And then on my third retreat, after I had all these wild experiences, this was in Malaysia, at the Malaysian Buddhist Meditation Center. And they, I, I, I was just doing noting practice. This is Mahasi Saidao noting, where I kind of started out in a mix of Vedanta and Thai forest and other things with Christopher and Charta and their, their people. Um, yeah, some Mahayana from Fed Van Almonds and Zen and Vipassana mixed in from Sabana Barzagi. And then, but then when I ran into Mahasi Saidao noting for my third retreat in Malaysia, I've been through all these crazy experiences, all this weird movements and perceptual stuff and vibrational things and mood stuff and like, what the heck, uh, you know? And then they played the scratchy old tape of this old Burmese monk talking about the stages of insight. And it's like called the tape. If you've been in a Mahasi retreat, you'll, they'll call it the tape. And they played this tape. I had never heard of any of this stuff. And he described in order what I had gone through. And this is a tape they'd clearly you know, played thousands of times and they have. And I was like, how did they know? And then they gave me some books, one of which was Mahasi Saito's Practical Insight Meditation, where I read about the sequences I had gone through it and had found incredibly empowering and normalizing. And then I ran into the Vasudhi Maga and, you know, the Moody Maga and these uh, texts that talk about these sta the stages. And it basically seemed like they had figured out something important about attentional anatomy and how it kind of develops or embryology really is development of attention. And then I started noticing this pattern everywhere. I started noticing Christian writings and Sufi writings, the sort of perennialist. A lot of people had described a progression like this, the dark night of the soul leading to, you know, various states of grace or what, whatever it was. Um, you know, revelation, uh, or you find these maps in Sufi stuff, you know, Ibn al-Arabi's journey to the Lord of power. You find it in, in, you know, classic mythology. You find it in Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. It just, just gets repeated again and again. And then I became something of a map perennialist. Like all these people had noticed this same basic human attentional development pattern in themselves and their own practice. And they're all writing about it, you know, through their own different lenses. So that's still a, a view I think is interesting, but so that's Daniel number one, but Daniel number two, the 
scientist and epidemiologist and biostatistician is also like, yeah, but how, how do you translate that in language and with clinical validation and understanding the underlying mechanisms and physiology? And, and then, you know, because that's what we need on this side, the healthcare admin, how do you incorporate systems process change side? And so Daniel 3 is trying to figure out how these two sides can understand each other a whole lot better and get along. And then this little microcosm that's happening in me, obviously people such as yourself and Julieta and lots of other people, you know, the over 230 people that are now in the EPRC have said, yeah, there's something about that resonates with me as well. And we're not the first person to have tried this, Esalen and transpersonal and, you know, going on back at least to the cosmic consciousness people 140 years ago have been noticing the same thing and trying the same thing. So we're really just parts of, a, of an iteration of trying to help the clinical mainstream realize something about the deep end that does have patterns to it that people have been describing for a long time, but to really bring the science to that, to help give it the epistemic weight that they require to incorporate this into the mainstream. And you, the stages, is that the genres? So the genres are one of the things. So you've got you've got two maps that are coming out of the Theravada. Well, really kind of three, but I'll start with two. One is the stages of insight, the highs, lows, weirds. You know, you you very simply explained, you see thoughts as thoughts, then you notice that intentions lead to actions, you know, sensations lead to mental impressions. You start to interact in some kind of mechanical way. Your body gets these weird energetic tensions. You start to notice something. And then there's some kind of opening, big opening. You know, you might call it Kundalini awakening. I might call it the arising and passing away. Other people are going to call it peak experience. You can call it a lot of different things. It's a it's a huge topic. It's very complicated. A lot of possible phenomenology, a lot of descriptions, bright white lights, trembling of limbs, powerful openings of oneness or void or all kinds of wild stuff can happen. It, it, I could talk literally for hours about that single topic. But then there's some kind of a crash and the Theravada would call this dissolution, fear, misery, disgust, desire for deliverance and something weirdly named, but reobservation, which is that real Ah, you know, and then opening out into equanimity, some sort of big, expansive, incorporative, integrative, flowy thing, and then realization. So that's the stages of insight. And then the genres and how the genres relate to that is a whole controversy. If some people say they do, some people say they don't, that that's that's there's a lot of hot water that and, you can and, get and into the there. Genres, because some people will be like, what are the genres? So the genres or dhyanas are these meditative states of absorption. And from a Theravada map point of view, which is just one way to describe them, you would start with like, I'm I'm stabilizing my attention on my object with applied and sustained attention. I've excluded myself from the hindrances and challenging states of mind. And so I have a happy abiding with you know a strong concentrated mind and bliss and peace and you know some mindfulness and presence to what's going on and then that's the first genre the second genre you kind of with the effort falling away the state becomes much more natural develops on its own has more rapture um, more bliss and more peace because you're you're not having to work so hard for it it's become a natural skillful thing that you can abide in and then that shifts to the third genre which is wide and tranquil and expensive and there's this sense of like peace that almost comes from detachment and, you know, the sort of wide, expansive piece. And then there's a fourth genre, which is the equanimity that is like, you know, very neutral body tone. And anyway, I've given these an incredibly right. superficial treatment. And then there are some people such as myself who think these two maps relate somehow. And uh -huh. this is where you get into controversy, right? Some people don't think they relate. But um, but that all can be validated. And so we actually have a study at Harvard where, you know, doing insight runs and genre runs, and we'll see which centers activate, you know, when you do certain ones, we're bringing in all kinds of other very adept meditators who can do that same kind of thing. And then we're going to compare that to psychedelic data. Um, we're going to compare that to some of the 5-MeO data and DMT data from Imperial College London. So right. we're going to like start answering at a neurophysiological level, what are the age-old correlations between these deep states of meditation and psychedelic experiences, at least as with our current technology and what can we, we measure now? So this is really exciting work that the Daniel Twos of the world, the scientist and doctor, is like, okay, there we go. We're starting to get something, right? right. And obviously, the medical world is starting to respond because Dr. Matthew Saket's work on this, trying to map these two different things, insight maps and jonic maps, you know, using neurophenomenology and, you know, the best scanners we have right now, seven Tesla scanners and high-density EEG and purpose-built algorithms to analyze this and new techniques. You know, uh, what can you show about these? And this was actually presented at Mass General uh, um, Psychiatry Department's Grand Rounds, so like which is one of the top psych research hospitals in the world. And so we're actually starting to actually make real progress to answer age old questions in our way using current methods, which, again, are limited. They have their problems. But that is how we will reach the mainstream today so that they can know things 
and be helpful rather than be ignorant and harmful like my dad would have been if I told him about this when I was a kid. Right. So um, just to kind of go into those stages a bit deeper, do you feel that um, a lot of people now are having awakening experiences um, through psychedelics, contemplation, or just spontaneously? Um, and 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 a, and a kind of, I mean, historically, I mean, what do you think about that? Do you think there are the people, or, or do you think that always happens and they're just, sometimes people just pop? And when that does happen, what does that mean? Like, are, are, are they, you know, are they in stream entry to use a Buddhist expression or what, 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 what or, or does it sometimes just that people have an awakening and then they go back to sleep as it were? Sorry, that's two questions. Well, that's actually a lot of different questions and raises a lot of things. So like the, the, the proprietary term of stream entry, which is, a, that was the third map that I didn't get Maybe to. Maybe I should come to that as a second question. Right. So then, then Buddhism has a lot of different maps of awakening or enlightenment or whatever you want to call it. Right. And, but, and one of which is the four paths, the first path of which is stream entry, which would be a permanent shift in the baseline perception of reality that reduces certain aspects of suffering. Mm. Um, and then... The question is, how many people are getting into that? And then are there experiences that are having some sort of equivalent to or related in some ways to stream entry? I actually think the vast majority are more likely related to what I would call the arising and passing away. Again, opinions on this vary. That's a Daniel 1 impression. Daniel 2 goes, yeah, but we need the science on that. Right. Yeah. And so... Um, and so, but you know, the rising and passing away can be super impressive. And so I think the vast majority of these first major openings that are really world shifting, it's something of a point of no return. It's entering like spiritual adolescence. It's a big shift. It's like a first taste of something profound after which the dark night or the knowledge of suffering or whatever, from my Daniel one-ish point of view, that's when that happens. And so when they have like a massive opening and then they kind of seem to fall or be confused or thrown by that. That I think is a lot of what's going on. But again, Daniel too says, okay, yes, but we need science on that. What are you basing that on? It's your expert opinion, you know, filtered through your own experiences and orthodoxy. Really, we haven't done, you know, we need better uh -huh. than that. And so that's what, and Daniel three agrees with Daniel two on this one. Right. Okay. Dan Daniel three goes, yes, very interesting. It is true that most of medicine is based on expert, you know, opinion based on their own personal case series and some consensus on that. That is true. On the other hand, in an ideal evidence based medicine world, we would have the physiology and the outcome studies and the progress in more neutral language that scales and isn't all bound up in Buddhist stuff. But simply look looking through at, a, you know, through a very phenomenological outcomes based progressive lens. Right. Okay. So that's and then the EPRC is trying to figure out how to how to be big enough to encompass all of those and have something move forward that helps people lend value to care, that helps meditation teachers and clinicians and everybody deal with this better, whether it's yeah. happening through psych. But my, in answer to your second or third or fourth question or whatever it was, do I think this is happening more? Yes, definitely. Like I'm quite convinced that more people are having this happen to them as meditative and I'll contemplative technology scales. Theory. Some They're getting into this territory, regardless of whether or not you want to call it something formal like awakening which gets very yeah. controversial. But That's let's true. just say they're right. getting into what I call emergent territory, right? Mm -hmm. And we I'm using the word emergent from an EPRC-ish point of view because we don't really know what it is. In the same way that in like chaos math, when a pattern emerges that you couldn't have predicted from initial you know, mathematical assumptions or same in biology or physics, right? There are these patterns that emerge. And this is a pattern emerging in experience that we can't predict from our current knowledge of neurons and serotonin and dopamine and whatever. We, we can't predict these experiences based on our underlying understanding of physics and physiology and chemistry or even psychology. And so right. I, I would call it emergent territory, regardless of whether or not you want to call it awakening. An emergent territory can have a lot of highs, lows, weirds, plateaus, variability. It's clearly not a linear path in nearly anybody. And so, and that's also the, all the territory we're talking about from psychedelics, sweat lodges, fasting, all kinds, you know, tr spontaneously, childbirth, there's all kinds of trauma. There's all kinds of ways that people can get into this territory. Right, right, right. And uh, yeah, okay. I mean, we could, I, I could ask you about the kind of terminology one uses, mystical, ecstatic, altered states, and you, you know, an EPRC has gone for this kind of emergent phenomena. 
Yes, um, we think it's the most scientific of the terminology. So for example, the term mystical, like what does mystical mean? From a certain point of view, you could say it's very precisely, you know, related to Christian mysticism. And, you know, it's got this sort of historical overlay. From another point of view, it's mystery or w yeah. what is it? And, and that's not satisfying to a scientist. And then why would someone's arms flapping be necessarily mystical? Why is seeing a bright white le light necessarily mystical? Uh, I, it, it doesn't make sense to them. We're spiritual. What does this have to do with spirits? If you saw a spirit, okay, they can sort of, at least it has some descriptive something, yeah. even if like it might be giving validity to the reality of spirits or something, which, you know, a typical materialist might not like to do, but at least they could understand the term. But mystical as it applies to most of this stuff, like your own experiences, right? You've had some challenging and strange and high and low and weird experiences. Mm -hmm. Why would you necessarily use the term mystical for the vast majority of those? Right. See what I, I mean? mean and so religious. classically, it's been called religious experience by William James. But right. And we don't like that one either, because this happens outside religions. of the context of religions. And yeah. so we, we're trying to be very precise yeah. and really honor the the linguistic and and linguistic precision needs of the this side over here, the scientists and the clinicians. Right. They need something right. straightforward that that isn't subject to all those swirling debates and yeah. and imprecisions. But it's very interesting, the, the kind of historical I, idea, which is it's so hard to prove. Uh, at, but but there, there is some kind of data. For example, Gallup has a poll asking people, have you ever had a mystical experience? Mm -hmm. about the again. Uh, and Americans, I mean, the last time they did it, they did it in 1962 and uh, about oh, what was it? Ten percent of people said they'd had a mystical experience in uh, in uh, two thousand and nine. Just under fifty percent said they right. had a mystical experience. And I I would love a survey to 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 be done on it again because I'm sure it's gone way up since then. So, but it but it is hard to um, to evaluate that kind of historical thing. I see similar things happening. People, but but of course, I'm talking to them. You know, like I'm I'm in this network now, so I'm I'm meeting people. You know, the 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 entrepreneur in Berlin who went to a yoga retreat and, and now they're having kind of two months of blissful states and so on. So yes. I get that sense. Oh, something interesting is happening, but I can't tell whether that's always been the case. Anyway. Well, yeah, and I must admit this Daniel one because I hung out this weird shingle. And if you're having these experiences, I'd be happy to talk to you. I ended up with a very yeah. weird friend circle. So it's yeah. it's nearly everybody I know now. It's like 95% of people I interact with have had some of these experiences, right? So, but yeah. it, you end up being a little bit like an ER doctor where you think everybody is driving drunk while texting on their phone and every infection, you know, sorry, every surgery gets infected and and like, you know, everybody is out there committing suicide and and you know. Exactly drinking, right. you know, and not taking care of their diabetes when that's not true, but that's just what comes to you. So I have real sample bias based on this. So I don't think my impression that this happens to nearly everybody is right. And that's, yeah. I recognize that's my skewed friend circle, but do I know it happens to a lot of people? Yeah. I think, I think I can say that reasonably well, the, or enough people to justify more. the project. And certainly yeah. there are vastly rarer diseases that have had vastly more money and scientific research put into them that in fact, you know, let, let's say it's only a million people worldwide where there are diseases that affect 10 people on the whole planet that have had yeah. vastly more money and research put into them than what we're doing, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. And I well, think it's vastly, let, let's say it's a, you know, let's say it was, you know, 12%, that'd be a billion people, right? Is that worth some real money? Maybe we spend a dollar per person to research some of their most important transformative spiritual experiences, well, that'd be a billion dollars. Does that sound fair and reasonable? I think it does. And why do you think it's uh, so important um, to research this area? Um, and uh, um, yeah. So given that, you know, the standard pitch line, which I still think is true, is that meditative and psychedelic and other related practices, emergent practices and modalities are scaling. The clinical mainstream understanding of them is not. And people who think this is not true, look at the textbooks of emergency medicine and emergency psychiatry. They're basically just as bad as 20 years ago when I trained. You know, um, they have almost like you would only a fool would want it to be in a modern emergency department rather than like the Zendo Project tent when they were having some crisis like this, right? Um, the Zendo Project tent with people who have expertise and training in this are, are going to give you vastly better care. 
I think. It's just going to be a much higher standard of care in terms of normalization, holding space, being able to relate to you skillfully, you know, understanding what's going on with you and being able to have a much more nuanced approach. And again, you know, then, then a standard emergency department, which is, you know, basically you either give meds or you don't, which basically is going to be give meds because these people are going to be weird. That's why they came in in crisis. You're going to give them a pathologizing diagnosis. You're going to send them in, maybe to an outpatient something about drug treatment or about, you know, psychosis or follow up with a psychiatrist who also similarly has no good diagnostic codes for this. The DSM-5 is nearly a disaster. It's got a few little things that maybe if this is happening in your spiritual tradition, you know, maybe it's okay if you're otherwise functional, but 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 that's so limited and was never flushed out that it's not functionally useful. And, and again, my colleagues in medicine who are going to be supporting all of these people, you know, because people do go to their psychiatrists and want to talk to their doctors about this. They didn't go into this to be ignorant and harmful, but in this case, they are. And we need to give them vastly better tools to do their jobs better, to add better service, to be less of a threat, more of a benefit, and everybody else out there helping. Like, let's say you're a psychedelic facilitator, you know? What are the best grounding techniques? Do we have any good science on that? Nobody's ever done it. We have opinions, maybe heavy foods and exercise or something. You know, I don't know. But like, do we actually have data to back that up? No, it's all anecdotal expert opinion stuff. It's all Daniel one level stuff, right? And Daniel two goes, well, but that's, where's the, where's the outcomes data? You know, and then Daniel two also, but recognizes there's a lot of stuff being described by Daniel one that they don't really have diagnostic codes for. They don't have defined management strategies for. They don't have treatment algorithms for if it's challenging. They don't, right. and they also can recognize the potential in this stuff if it really can lead to bliss and peace and increased mental well-being and reduction in suffering. Wouldn't that be awesome? Because we're seeing an onslaught of mental health crisis, right? It's mm. a it's a disaster, suicide and anxiety and depression and trauma and it, it's awful, right? Kids particularly. I don't mean to be fear mongering, but like you work in a PZR, you're gonna you're just gonna be overwhelmed by kids in crisis these days. And if this stuff somehow could help them, which it's been promised to for thousands of years, if there's any real potential there, we should be studying that and we should be figuring out how to incorporate it to help all these people who are, who are having a really hard time. And so, so that's the think, other sense of impetus for it, right? Yeah, right. So there's the, um, so first of all, there's the um, pathology or suffering side of it, which is that sometimes people have, the experienced emergent phenomena, uh, which can also be called altered states, religious, mystical, spiritual experiences, they've been called them in the past. Sure, right. That and people will continue to call them that in the future. We're not going to suddenly uh, change the terminology. And we don't, yeah. And um, and because sometimes those kinds of experiences involve suffering or or unusual uh, thoughts or behavior stuff that's a little bit uh, on on the kind of beyond the normal. Yes. And um, this this is what motivates you, you to do your own work, yeah. right? Because you know yeah. about this. Have you told your story yeah. on this podcast or video? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So so just to just to, uh, you know, as we know, sometimes these things are are, are then treated. People get, want want help and guidance because it involves turbulence. These yes. Experiences. Is. they're scary it can be very confusing happens, and destabilizing confusing. Can disrupt, disrupt relationships yeah. work school health um yeah, whole sense of identity crazy. yeah sure yeah. when they might be actually going culture. through what i would think of as normal processes that we intentionally cultivate on retreats and stuff right because our culture as you say doesn't really have maps guides or terminology for these kinds of emergent phenomena. Well, it does. They're just hidden in these sort of open places. I mean, now with the internet, yeah. you have access to everything, you know, and yeah. you can find books on this stuff. It's not like it isn't available, but people yeah. don't find it often. They crash around and they don't know, and they get told all sorts of strange things by all kinds of people that hopefully are well-meaning, you know, and not yeah. exploitative, but some, and then they crash into the healthcare system, which is very limited right now. And again, it didn't. It doesn't like to think of itself as limited. The healthcare th system likes to think of itself as the best, the most professional, the most knowledgeable, the most sane yeah. and reasonable. I'm not sure that's true at the moment. So, um, on the health side of things, if someone is having some kind of psycho spiritual turbulent experience, and they went to a psychiatrist, or maybe they were sent to an emergency room, well, how would they likely be diagnosed now 
So your diagnostic options are very limited. If it's related to a psychedelic, they might just say, you know, this is psychedelic, this is intoxication from a psychedelic and maybe give them a benzo and or antipsychotic and let them sleep it off. And hopefully they have a family and hopefully they have no re residual stuff, right? Because as you know, sometimes people take a psychedelic, they go up, they are weird, they come down, they are not. And they go about their lives and not much has changed, right? There are mm -hmm. plenty of people who have partied plenty of times on psychedelics and they didn't have a massive existential transformation or any profound benefits right. or challenges, right? This is a thing. But sometimes, as we both know, people go up, they come down, but where they land is really, really different from where they were a few days ago. And that different might go on for hours, days, weeks, months, years, the rest of their lives. And right. that different might in the short, medium and long term be either for each one, better or worse. It might be way worse, as you know, and that's the important work that you do. It might yeah. be way better, right? They might have yeah. massive healings and transformations as the Johns Hopkins continues to point out about psilocybin and cancer and stuff, right? And other, and anxiety and depression or, you know, maps. And they continue to point out about MDA and MDMA and trauma. But I yeah. also know people who took some MDMA, went way up into a peak experience, and then the crashed hard into dark night stuff. So I also think it can facilitate this insight cycle, which can be very, very nonlinear and confusing, in the in which case they get diagnosed with bipolar or bipolar 2 or bipolar 2 set ra rapid cycling, which is a diagnosis that basically says you're broken for life. You'll be on meds for the rest of your life. It's just going to get worse unless we control it with meds. There's no beneficial anything out of this, except reluctantly acknowledge that when people are quote unquote manic, they may be somewhat more creative, but also more prone, prone to risky behavior and wrecking their lives and driving everybody crazy. <laughs> and um, so like, the, but the appreciation of the potential transformative side is very limited. And then the problem is a lot of these diagnoses have, c carry the notion that you are messed up forever. And that story, as we've noticed in psychedelics, right? So as, as Chris Timmerman's research shows, what the psychedelic, what the shaman or the psychedelic trip sitter or whatever says to you in or shortly after a trip, there's a neuroplasticity and a receptivity to messaging. If you put into that receptive state, you are now broken for life and will need meds for the rest of your life and have a stigmatizing diagnosis that might ruin your career and make you unhirable or uninsurable if you're in a barbaric country that your insurance is determined by your previous medical conditions and stuff like the United States. Um, uh, you know, then this this can be an absolutely catastrophic experience and really detrimental to an entire person's sense of identity of what, you know, and and totally potentially divor divorce them from any potential healing or transformative potential that might be happening in this nonlinear process. Not that bipolar, and, and I think it's classic form doesn't exist. I actually do think it exists um, as a thing. I've seen it. I have friends that I think have it. They don't describe any insights, no transformative stuff. They just get a lot of energy and do damaging things. And then they get really sad and do damaging things. Right. So there doesn't seem to be any obvious benefit to them from this, but, and then you've got people who may have both, right? This is where it gets really confusing. And how do you sort this out? They have maybe insight cycles and they have classic bipolar. And sometimes these do interesting things with each other. And then what do you do with that, right? Some mix of meds and meditative practices to participate, you know, to facilitate the transformative healing or something or whatever. Like th that, this is going to take a lot of science to sort out. I don't have the right answers. I can simply identify that I think there is a Venn diagram of overlap of what I personally think based on my limited skewed case series and biases are two related, but somewhat different things, but almost certainly are going to involve some of the same brain pathways. Be amazed. I would be amazed if they didn't. And I so think then that's really interesting. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. And then you've got things like you might be diagnosed as psychotic, which is not helpful. That's a purely pathologizing diagnosis. And maybe the angels you saw that restructured your DNA and healed you of your trauma, you now have a label in a vulnerable state that you were told that was purely pathology. You were simply crazy and there was nothing redeeming about that experience at all, which can set up these weird internal conflicts when a part of you goes, wow, but I really felt healed, but maybe that was all crazy and there's no validity in my healing. Well, that's not something you want to do as a clinician, right? To totally invalidate something that was really beneficial for somebody. That's not your your job, hopefully. And so, or as any kind of facilitator or provider or just friend, right? You know, 
you hopefully are not doing anything like that. And so, um, you know, and the best you can hope for is adjustment disorder, which is adjustment disorder, sort of this catch all category. Have you had something you needed to adjust to and you're having trouble adjusting to it? It's the most benign and less pathologizing of all of the, you know, diagnostic categories you're likely to get out of the DSM that don't involve psychosis or bipolar or delusions or hallucinations or drug use problems or whatever. So, but, but that still is very unsatisfying to those of us who have seen vastly more sophisticated maps that really seem not only predictive and descriptive, but also prescriptive in terms of how to do something useful with those experiences. So I think the best of the maps, again, not only describe and normalize and predict what will happen next and predict maybe even what came before, but but also have the sense of potential that you can you can take whatever's going on with you. And for you know thousands and thousands of years, countless people have figured out cool things you can do with your mind that allow you to, to, to work skillfully with each of these phases of practice and attain some sort of benefit from it on average. And again, Daniel too goes, yeah, but where's the clinical data that shows that's true? Where's the clinical data that shows benefit, right? And then Daniel three goes, okay, let's see how you two can come up with a study that meets both of your needs in terms of honoring what you think is true on Daniel one side and honoring the methods and, you know, epistemic requirements and it needs to you know make the numbers better and get people off ER beds and reduce medication costs and you know balance national health system budgets and reduce anxiety and depression and reduce outpatient you know resource utilization because that's what this side needs to incorporate it and we think we can do that i think there's enough here on this side that with the scientific methods of this side we can help this side right, right. and that should help everybody that's involved in this process so just to go back to something you said um the, the, you, so one could, if one went to a psychiatrist or an emergency ward um, in one of these states, be diagnosed as just psychotic, like not as experiencing temporary psychosis, but as a psychotic. So being psychotic, right? So, so yeah, and, but I mean, yes. I'm just yes. curious about the understanding of psychosis now. Is it always understood as you are a psychotic? As okay, in... so so psychosis is is actually describing a state, and then when you start to make that kind of permanent, like you are now a you were a this kind of person, yeah. now, that's when you start getting into the whole question of schizophrenia, and schizotypal, right? right? Yeah. So these there are these these categories where you say you now are, ah, you will exactly. be this way. So does yeah. schizophrenia like th there's not I'm really curious. room for the sense that someone is not schizophrenic, becomes schizophrenic, and is now totally non-schizophrenic. There really yeah. isn't quite that understanding, although there is some data that people, some people will sort of get better and some people are, but there is this general sense, once you trigger in the whole notion of schizophrenic, right, there is this general sense, this is now how you are and you will be this way for the rest of your life. Something in your yeah. brain is damaged, you're missing the structures, you don't have the, and and now you're basically, your options are atypical antipsychotics, you know, Bilify, whatever. Because why I'm interested in this is people, quite a few people now are having um, extended what are described as psychotic states after psychedelics, uh, particularly young people. And um, I'm very curious about what they are told and what their families are told mm -hmm. when they go to um, a psychiatrist or an emergency ward uh, and whether there's an understanding, OK, this could be an episode of psychosis, but it doesn't mean it, you know, like, is there an understanding that there are possible variable outcomes and this could be handled in different ways and it doesn't or does it are they always going to be treated as lifelong? Oh, this is the you know, this is, you are now a schizophrenic or it, sure. it, I suppose it depends. It can go either way. And it depends on sort of how trigger happy with um, lifelong diagnoses your diagnosticians are. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are, and there are some, like, it should have been going on for so long and it should have this, you know, it should at least have this many of the symptoms and stuff. So there is some of that. I, I mean, to totally rag on the DSM, it's not like it's not based on something. It is it's based on, you know, there's plenty of, there is some logic and reason. And, and in your clinical practice, you can see people for whom some of these diagnostic categories make tremendous sense. You just go, yep, that really seems to fit some portion of the population I see. But there are also you know, that's through a very Daniel two kind of a lens. It's very easy to look through that lens and see a lot of clarity, but there, you can also look through that lens and see a lot of shades of gray, right? right, right. Where there are these funny things where, so I, I cannot tell you at, through Daniel one, remember I hung out that shingle and said, if you're having weird yeah. stuff, you know, a lot of these people crashed into the healthcare system, got diagnosed as bipolar, right? From what I would think of as 
just classic stages of insight. They describe all the additional phenomenology you would expect and some of the insights and the transformations and the benefits. And yet it's got this up and down thing they didn't understand that is new for them. They weren't going up and down before. Now they are. Or, you know, and so uh, how many of them have been diagnosed as bipolar two or bipolar one or bipolar two rapid cycling is the common one. And then they attained to, you mentioned one of those things like paths or whatever, and suddenly like they just don't meet any of the criteria anymore. Like they are just clearly not that anymore, which is not built into the sense of the natural history of bipolar disorder. And here we have a real phenomenological clinical, how they're actually presenting, what their life actually goes like discrepancy. And they're also, there's no notion of like a hard line in their life. We're like, yeah, I had this big opening and then I was going up and over and then I had this thing. And now poof, this moment, they can identify the time, day and second when it went away. That from a mental health point of view is amazing, right? That's the kind of stuff that needs to be studied because if you can take people who are having these wild swings and hard times and challenges, and suddenly they really don't meet criteria at all and they can pinpoint the moment and the phenomenology and even the micro phenomenology that led to that reversal of what was considered a lifetime diagnosis, that from any mental health point of view, if people actually want people to get better rather than to stay on expensive meds their whole lives, you know, and remain as patients should be super interesting to people. So that's the kind that's of potential that Daniel one points out to the Daniel two, two kids and say, Hey, you should, you should be paying attention to this because this happens and it's described and they're like, interesting, show me the data. So how do we get the data? And the data involves science, and that takes money. Sorry, I'm getting into my fundraising pitch now. But yeah. um yeah. yeah. Is that being studied? Has that been studied so far? No. No, okay. So and what you need to do that, because the problem is this is doing that one. You could start with a case series of people who were, you know, diagnosed as bipolar now really do not seem to be. That's interesting. Right. And you can get the descriptions from them. And that study needs to be done. Right. Very much. Um, and maybe they even got some like, you know, they, they were like here in their life. And then they entered this weird thing where they're going up and down and they had this moment. And now they're here. Like they're better. Their baseline is substantially improved by this process. They're more functional, more loving, more kind, more wise, more stable, more whatever. You know, that actually mirrors something of my own story. Right? I can tell you the day. Right. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, when like, I can tell you that the, this the instant and what it was like, and then I was just better. It just you know, and this is plenty of people in my friend circle have that kind of experience. And then how do you get people to do that? But this has not been well studied, and it needs to be. And to really do it, to really get the, the problem is then you get into expensive research. You can do the case series, fine and interesting, but to actually catch this as it's happening, right? To actually catch people and catch their moments and be able to get neuroimaging on it before and after and comparative outcomes and really prove that there's something perceptual, psychological, existential, you know, functionally better that these transformations have actually wrought rather than just someone saying that, which is interesting, but how do you prove it? Well, that's where we get into some of the big projects of the EPRC, like the Emergence Research Center, where we bring people in for intense, intensive imaging during intensive practices. You know, they're doing intensive retreats or whatever, and we have the scanners and the EEGs and the phenomenologists and everything there, and we can follow them up with outcomes and everything. You know, that's a, that's you know, it's 150 million bucks to build that new research center that does not exist. There is no real place to do that right now that is set up in the kind of way you'd need. So we need to build a new de novo thing. But then there's, you know, and then some of the other big expensive studies we talk about, like, because this is, there's so many other factors that impinge on this. It's lifestyle medicine. So like the Framingham study, this multi-generational study that looked at tens of thousands of people over decades to determine what of all the factors of lifestyle cause heart disease, right? And cardiovascular disease. That's, that's how we know a lot of the stuff about heart disease. The Framingham study took a long time, cost a lot of money because you have so many possible variable factors and co you know, confounders and stuff. But, but if you have big enough data, you can actually start to look at that, particularly with our new AI technology, which can see patterns we can't. But we're, but still, that pr those big perspective studies are like the China study was. It was like the Grand Prix of dietary epidemiology, you know, really helping to understand what kind of dietary stuff led to what outcomes of cancer, heart disease, you know, obesity, you know, arthritis, et cetera. And so, um, 
the, the China study is another one of the things. And so to do some of this big lifestyle research that really answers these questions with the kind of data that you need to sort that out, that's going to take real cash. And, you know, like, you know, that study is probably 100 million, 150 million bucks. So, wow. but but this is not that much money in the big scheme of health. When you consider how big the mental health crisis is and how expensive it is and the transformative potential, if we could build these two things and really get the evidence quality we need to sort out what really does lead to better outcomes, what really does help these people, what really are the transformative and healing potentials and how can we really deal with some of the challenging things that can be caused by this strange journey. You know, it's small money in the big scale of things, if there's, let's say a billion people, this is happening to that, you know, that's, right. we haven't even spent a dollar per person at that level. You know, we spent right. like 30 and, cents and, per and, person, maybe. And there's the kind of helping people through difficulties and, and, and getting them off meds or if, if that's possible or, sure. or, or, or to better outcomes. And there's also the, the carrot of blissful states and improved, yes. improved functioning and, and better people, wiser people. Yes, exactly. If you had, um, if if uh, someone gave you a million dollars, um, I know you because you talk in, uh, in in hundreds of millions. Mm -hmm. um, if if someone gave you a million, um, what would be like? You know, what's top of your list of things that you think is the most critical to to learn or to build? We were just actually having that conversation this morning, and it's related to what we call the minimum viable product. So our minimum viable product is actually about two million. Two million is the like the lowest I could even feel comfortable possibly selling it. But mm -hmm. I can tell you what I do for a million. So if someone said, "Here's a million dollars for emergency benefactors. What are you going to do with it?" First, I would fund the second half of phase two, right? So you you think you found like some funding for the first part of phase two? You know, hundred k, and you got the next part of phase two. Give you a lot of work. Yeah, huh? right. Right, exactly. So yeah. this, this is one of the top things we would do. Next, mm. I would spend $300,000 in what we call the expert opinion study. Um, and mm. the expert opinion study is, this is how most of medicine functions, right? So most of medicine is actually based on expert opinion. You get a bunch of people together and you get to go through some sort of process to get con some consensus. Most of medicine is not built on the prospective comparative outcome trials we all dream it would be. It isn't. So what, what we would do is interview basically 150 people of the people who have been for decades each helping people with this stuff, emergent phenomenology, psychedelics, meditation, sweat lodges, indigenous practices, whatever, right? So you've, you've got the, the Emma Bragdons and the Joseph Goldsteins and the jungle shamans and the ayahuasca arrows and the, you know, all of these people, you know, the, the, the backroom trip sitters in Amsterdam and, you know, but uh -huh. they've, you know, they've, they've spent decades, they know. They know what's out there. They know the range. They've seen it for themselves. They have their favorite things that they think help. They have their ways of conceptualizing this, right? And then we just do super long form interviews, hours and hours and hours. What do you see? How do you deal with it? And basically ask them, if we give you a blank tech chapter that you could just write in the textbooks used for board certification in emergency medicine, psychiatry, and psychology, what would you write? that you think is ready for clinical prime time, that you think every clinician across the globe should know, please tell me that, right? What would you put in it? And then we take 150 of those, we see where the areas of consensus are. Like everybody agrees heavy diet is gonna help ground people down or something. I don't know if that's true. I just, you know, uh -huh. maybe, yeah. right? Maybe it's just as a possible example, you know? Uh -huh. And then maybe there's real disagreement on how to deal with like some of the dark challenging stuff. Right. Uh -huh. Maybe there's like, no, you should totally be doing this. Nope. You should totally never do that. You should absolutely do this. You should totally okay. do body based practices. No, you should not do it because that's where the trauma is or whatever. Right. And then we take these honest areas of controversy where experts, kind, well meaning experts in the field who have collectively thousands of years uh -huh. and, you know, and hundreds of thousands of patients experience between them. You know, what do they disagree on? Those are the things we need to then go forward with prospective comparative trials and say, when is, because there's probably situations in which both sides are true, right? And then how do we differentiate when we do this one, when we do that one? Or maybe some people are just wrong. They've been doing something for years and it turns out it's just not helpful, right? That's and then really we can actually determine that. And so that's yeah. the expert opinion study and that we would then take the recommendations from that and hand them to the people, say, this is literally the best we've got. 
right now, we think this is better than what you have in your textbooks. I would, I would guarantee it would be right that I would bet everything I have, it would be better than what's in the current textbooks now and say, here are your diagnostic criteria, you know, categories we need. Here's your diagnosis and management strategies. Here's your algorithms. Here's your trees. And here's the pathway for further research. So that's the next thing I would do. Um, so I'm going to stop there if you think that was interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, so, so sure. So there's there's the gathering of uh, knowledge. I think, it, you know, um, and you've talked about also having kind of case studies. You present everyone with a case study. Okay, patient A is presenting with these. What's going on? What do you do? I, and I mm -hmm. think that you know, that'd be really interesting with, with, with psychedelics as well and difficulties after psychedelics. Yep. So there's gathering of expertise and then there's the interfacing with the, the, the kind of mental health um, sector and particularly with psychiatry. And, and then there's the idea of textbooks and training as a key node of influence. You yep. want to get, you know, you're trying to get into textbooks, get into training. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So okay. this is generational change, right? So this, right. this will, th there's a lot of inertia to medical healthcare systems and there will be even more inertia around as something as weird as this or controversial, right? So we we anticipate, you know, if the average benchtop thing, they figure yeah. out some pathway on a benchtop that's chemistry, the average time before that's actually impacting something in clinical medicine is 17 years. Uh -huh. We think this is weirder than that. And so while we think we can make some quick splashes with the Expert Opinion Project, and maybe if we're lucky, get incorporated into some textbooks, to really change this will require an entire generation to retrain rethink, re-become educated. It will need to get into the medical school curricula and, and, you know, mental health school curricula, and it will need to get into board certification. So there'll be four, you know, criteria. So they'll be forced to learn it. It'll need to get into ICD-11, uh, the World Health Organization, and the DSM-5TR and the Chinese CCMD-3 and the Latin American equivalents, right? And that level of integration actually takes a lot of lobbyists. It takes a lot of politics, takes a lot of committee time. It's not cheap. People need to be supported while they do this, this work of convincing the gatekeepers that they have something that adds value, not just to human lives, but also to bottom lines. Right. What about once people have maybe come through these the challenges and they're beginning to develop, they also want growth. Um, what, what do you envisage emerging there uh, culturally? That's a great question. Well, culturally, there's always this, there's already this tremendous sense of a thousand things you can do to make yourself better, right? That is huge marketing. You can be, you know, smarter, you can be more productive, you can be more calm, you can be less anxious, you can be less depressed, you can be more happy, right? This is, this marketplace it, through a variety of forms of modalities and supplements and exercises and, you know, everything is already huge. However, it would be great if the vast majority of that was actually based on much better data of what really, you know, that's why we need some of the big studies, some of the big long-term studies. Here are the people who did yoga for 10 years, are they actually better? Here are the people who did a bunch of microdosing, are they better? Here are the people who did, well, you know, they've been doing mindfulness for 10 minutes a day or TM or whatever, or prayer, all these cool things. Are they better? What did it do? And do you have big enough data to actually say that we know these things do something useful? And to be, because people want to, you know, they have limited resources, they have limited time. They do, hopefully do care about outcomes for themselves. And then, right. you know, what should they actually be doing? And I get yeah. this question from people with tons of resources. You know, they're billionaires. And what meditative practice should I be doing? Should I, should I, you know, should I go on a 10-day a Goenka retreat or should I take five grams of shrooms and big hit of five MEO at the peak of it? I get these actual questions. <laughs> I wish I could tell them something other than the skewed impressions of Daniel 1. Daniel 2, the doctor in me, wants data right? Wants to know, like, well, what can I tell them? Yeah. What are the predisposing factors for good outcomes? What are your specific goals that these things might meet? And where is the intersection of what you're coming in with, what you want to do, and what's available and what we know about it? And can we know vastly more about it so you can make vastly better informed choices, right? Because yeah. we're grounded in medical ethics, which is about, you know, autonomy, which is based on informed consent, which is based on high quality data on the risks, benefits, and alternatives, doing good, avoiding harm, and then scaling that globally, right? That's the current conception of uh, medical ethics. And but so that information that. piece is yeah. why we need that. And that will go into the great marketplace of how you can be a better you. But I think, uh, I guess I was getting at that both you and I are very interested in like uh, 
uh, research and a kind of empirical spirituality. Neither of us, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, uh, totally rooted in one particular religious tradition. Maybe... Oh, I'm definitely not. Okay. So um, I'm curious whether you think um, the cultural frameworks for all these people popping like popcorn uh, in Western cultures now through these through practices or just spontaneously, do you think that that is what's going to emerge culturally? It's going to be more of this kind of network, people who maybe are using practices, maybe some of them are in particular traditions, but they're sharing their experience, they're sharing data, and it's that kind of um, will continue to emerge as opposed to the oh, revival of, of uh, you know, more monasteries and more or, or, of, or of contemplative Christianity or of Buddhism. Um, almost certainly both are true. The, the sort of swirling counter movements of orthodoxy and innovation is nothing new. So all of the orthodox traditions arose from innovation. Someone did something new. Right, someone put something together in a new way, discovered something new, or that they felt was new, expressed it in a new way. Right, so that's the paradox of orthodoxy: is it came out of no, then there was this revelation, this discovery, this you know, this articulation of something, you know, and then so so that's the funny thing, and then so there's this dynamic tension between orthodoxy and innovation, where what they're saying is no, we have the new, latest, and greatest thing that is really the best that came and is better than all these things before. So obviously that is gonna be a dynamic conversation and the interaction of science and orthodoxy and action and reaction and, and you know, thesis, antithesis right. and synthesis, that swirl will continue, right? And and we are, will just be one more iteration in a great long, hopefully many centuries or millennia more if we don't blow ourselves up or fry ourselves or pandemic right. ourselves or whatever, you know, um, you know barring existential threats, uh, hopefully we'll, we will just be one footnote in a grand conversation that will continue to iterate and hopefully have people better relate to all of these things. Because when I tr look at the traditions, even the ones that seem relatively fixed, you know, the Catholic mystical tradition has continued to develop with fascinating iterations and discoveries and articulations and phenomenology. Sufism, you know, Buddhism as well. Buddhism is a fascinating um, intersection of, of very long-lived, entrenched, very intact orthodoxies, and yet fascinating amounts of innovation. If you look at the Mahayana or even the Theravada, which actually in its esoteric forms gets super creative, what's to say, and complicated. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, well, I, I, we've spoken for an hour. Um, there were things we haven't covered, like I wanted to ask you about the realization stage. Um, you know that you you had a, a, a experience that you describe as as a kind of enlightenment experience, and that you like and you, a you number. Know, uh, there were, there were right. tears to this thing, right? It wasn't just one. Yeah. There were a bunch. And so you have a very interesting attitude that like that from 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 reading in your book that we think now of mindfulness as a kind of therapy but you know it's not it's not it wasn't principally designed to heal trauma or make you more relaxed or kind of heal suffering it was like you follow these steps and practices you will get enlightened uh, and and this happens and this reliably happens reliably is a funny word but definitely is one of the things that can happen right so it's right. one of the things you might expect to happen in some non-trivial portion of people who do these that's why they did them back in the day but mindfulness is a fascinating one so let me let me give both sides of the argument mm. uh, on the one hand the term mindfulness one it can be mindfulness of one's speech mindful mindful of one's thoughts mindful of one's emotions you know mindful of one's body mindful of one's states of mind and just the simple awareness of that is obviously very useful. Mindfulness of one did an action and what its consequence was, mindfulness. So from a certain very ordinary point of view, it is true that mindfulness is described in the old text as being able to pay attention to remember uh, what is going on and and, and to be present that, that would inform all of the aspects of the various trainings in a traditional you know, three trainings Buddhist context context. You have to be mindful for sila or shila. You have to be mindful for samadhi. You have to be mindful for wisdom, panya or prajna, right? So the, getting very Buddhist orthodox for the moment, right? Which is mm. only one of the many places I could go. And, and and on the other hand, it was explicitly the notion of seeing your thoughts come and go that would uh, you know lead to some permanent emotional transformations was explicitly that third training of wisdom 
that would lead to insight and permanent shifts in the relationship to and perception of an interpretation of phenomena at the deepest existential levels that we would call awakening. So both are true, but the mindfulness movement made something of a grand bargain. Um, early on, it wasn't quite so clear what the bargain was, but as it evolved, it recognized it was going to scale in the clinical mainstream by sticking very much to the shallow end. This is going to reduce anxiety and depression. This is going to help people deal with trauma. This is going to help them simply you know, have a filter on what they say because they'll be mindful of their thoughts before they say them and lead to better human interactions and mental health in a very... Um, basic sense. And it's not that that wasn't described in the old text. It is. But the other side was the big prize, right? That would have been seen as the small prize in comparison to the big prize of awakening that was the reason for, you know, for founding a 2,500 year lived religion out of it that spread across Southeast Asia and now spreading around the world in various forms. And so to like to cut off not only the the benefits, but also the known challenges and the weird stuff. These practices were known to lead to powers and seeing beings and weird energetic stuff and uh, you know lots of strange things that makes the people who want to scale this stuff clinically very nervous because they know the clinical mainstream is not well, very ready for that. But if you look actually at the inter the early books of John Cabot Zinn, like you know wherever you go, there you are in full catastrophe living. Some of these earlier books really do hint at explicitly, this is about awakening, this is about the wide range, this is about the full thing. And then they realized they couldn't scale with that, the, the, the market wasn't ready. And again, they might not like my interpretation of this, but they knew. Like, does Joseph Goldstein know the wide range of wild stuff that can happen from this stuff? Yes, he has. You know, how many countless tens of thousands of people has he heard describe these things? You know, and yet he books, right? And yet they're, so that they're in a very complicated political position. We have this notion in the work of the EPRC will in some ways help pave the way for more of the full range of what mindfulness is, in addition to every other spiritual tradition that would love to have their deeper end better appreciated, right? We're not just singling out Buddhism here. You know, every Pentecostal who's ever been nervous to talk about their experiences with their psychiatrist or mental health practitioner, or everybody who had, you know, some revelation of Allah or, you know, saw spirits in the jungle or whatever it was, you know, that we're we're trying to to help the the medical world relate to all of that. In a right. much more skillful, nuanced, sophisticated, uh, you know, hopefully value-adding way. Well, let me just, um, you know, can you perhaps for our, for our final bit, could you tell us a bit about that kind of big prize then, and um, what what it is? Because I think I I think people are very into like, oh, I'm going to try a bit of meditation. I'm doing like me, I'm doing 20 minutes a day and I feel kind of clearer in bed and so on. But like, yeah, but the totally big prize, never to never talk about the big prize really in, in the West anymore. And so what is that big prize? Tell me about your experience of it. Um, should people aspire to it? So this, so th those are actually two huge questions and uh, um, it depends on how long you want to go. I personally can go uh, for another 30 minutes I don't know what your time constraints are. Do you have a hard stop? No. Cool. So I'm I'm gonna I can give this about thirty minutes, and right. uh, then hopefully we'll wrap up. And sorry for okay. running over for anybody who expected this to be an hour. If there were people out there with that expectation, so two questions: What was my experience of it? Right. So what's been my experience? My experience, I, I describe a lot of this. If you want to read tons of details, by the way, in mctb.org, you can go and download the book for free or read it online, or uh, there's now an audio book available as well on my SoundCloud. It's your book, Mastering the Core Teachings. Uh, Mastering the, the Core Teachings of the Buddha, second edition, and you, or if for some, you know, and those are both free, but if for some reason you want to pay for it, you can buy it on Amazon or Audible. I give all the money I get from that to charity or or Dharma projects or whatever. It's a great so I don't read and it's 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 a yeah, it doesn't it's not a dense, uh laborious, painful read. It's Thank an you. enjoyable read. Thanks. I appreciate that. But you know, so uh so I, I go into lots of details there, but the 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 basic thing is um the final result of what I did. A, I should I should mention it wasn't easy. So like what I've gotten is somewhat unusual even the, in the realm of Buddhist meditation. And also I should mention that by claiming the things I do, there's a lot of controversy around that. So for those who are going to post a bunch of comments or whatever, just recognize that I've heard every single comment you're going to make about, oh, being, you know, crazy or delusional or exaggerating or something fine. Um, 
But all of those qualifiers out of the way, what happened is actually relatively simple to describe in some ways. So imagine just for a moment that you're like in the room as your baseline. Your baseline is present to the sights and the sounds, to the actual experience of thoughts, which in, from this point of view is very are very, very wispy, to the experience of emotions, which take up a very, very small portion of experience, but are very clear, but relatively subtle. So I have, you know, sensations in here and here and here related to emotional things, it's, which is signal now, very important signal. Oh, my stomach feels a little bit weird about that. Huh, I wonder what that's telling me, right? But it, so there's a proportionality, which is important, right? So the default mode network, if you want to say the default mode network at baseline is very, very deactivated. That's another way to explain this. It's not like I can't, you know, put my eyes up and tune out the room and see what's on my calendar or whatever. I can, all that can happen. But my baseline is much more here um, in a way that it was not before. And what that does is lend a walking around proportionality to thoughts, which are these super wispy little things that are like barely a sight and barely a sound and barely a feeling. So, but I can still think fine, as you can see, I can think on my feet pretty well. And, and obviously was able to be a doctor and, you know, do pretty fancy biostatistics and stuff. So like the capacities are still there, but the perception of them in, in the moment is at baseline radically different. And this is something I don't have to work for or do or remember to do. And this also gives a radically transformed relationship to emotions where most of the room is fine, which is the sum total of experience. And so the proportion of anything that can be stressed out is a very small portion of, of experience, the room or the space I'm in, whatever it might be, if I'm outside, et cetera. And, and there's also this very high degree of natural clarity because the mind isn't doing this weird thing where it's trying to figure out how it is in relationship to all these things. It's not con tr constantly trying to turn the sensations of the back of my head into a stable knower, doer, in control watcher. That process stopped 20 years ago. Thank into God. A, uh, weaving it into a narrative of yourself. Right. Your and, and it's not like I can't think, oh, I am Daniel here talking to you, Jules, and we're talking about the EPRC and I will have a meeting afterwards. You know, thoughts of time and space and identity all, all work fine. But the, the proportionality and the experience of them and the directness and the clarity about them is radically different. And that has made all the difference. This was the most valuable thing I ever did. It came through straightforward investigation of my sensate, sensate reality and learning to shift through a progressive developmental thing, which is predictable, that eventually leads to something that is way more open, clear, direct, present, proportional. It's just better. And regardless of whether or not you call it awakening or not, whatever one labels you want to put on it or not, this just, there was like before and after, and this beats the crap out of the previous way of perceiving and relating to reality. So mm -hmm. this has been the most important mental health upgrade that ever happened for me, or, you know, positive psychology upgrade from baseline and made my baseline way better, more functional, more clear, more capable. Um, yeah, just vastly better relationship to thoughts and emotions, existence, et cetera, deep questions. So that's that's the most important thing. And then the ability to instantly drop into, you know, blissful, peaceful states on command basically or you know whenever i want to or even sometimes when i just lay down and close my eyes that's super good so the genres are nice and you know something of the expanded palette of experiences of like you know the wide range of experiences that i you know i have when i go on retreat or even sometimes at baseline that people might relate to a little more strangely you might call it the magical end of things or whatever to use one possible bit of language that's we're going to lose some people here just by saying that but those experiences occur and my um, the range of them and the relationship to them is just vastly improved. So that's a whole nother topic. I've talked about that. If you want to listen to my, I've got some other podcasts where I go on for hours and hours about, on, about this on chaotic thinking um, is a podcast, Liminal Warmth. And, um, and there's another one I did with Monk on a Motorbike. Uh, so if you want to find those, I talk on and on about those things. But so, so that's- a little bit more about them. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so I just, for example, went on a fire casino retreat where you're cultivating experiences that me, my, people, people might consider strange. And so actually I like this, this thing, you know, HPPD, you know, this uh, persistent stuff that can happen after you take a psychedelic. Well, my baseline, yeah. since I was a child, actually, I see kind of statically colored snow that can sometimes start organizing itself into patterns just at right. baseline. When I go mm -hmm. on retreats, particularly doing visualization practices, that gets a lot stronger. And that then that can sometimes form into things that have a lot more coherence and seeming meaning to them. Now, 
since I've been doing this for a long time, when I initially started having those experiences, it was easy to take them very seriously or perhaps more seriously than they deserved. These days, I take them uh, generally with all the seriousness of the pattern of a cloud in the sky, uh, even though it might be a beautiful cloud in the sky turning itself into an interesting pattern or shape or a face or message or whatever. So right. uh, there's something in that increased range that has helped to sort of re-enchant my life. And I am deeply appreciative of that, though it might not every be everybody's cup of tea. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, right. Does that um, help? Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, so, I mean, I guess, it, you know, the, the, there's this sense uh, that you called it casina? Casina, so fire casina. Casina is an old Pali word that mm. um, relates to almost certainly very pre-Buddhist practices where you mm. take something as an external support for concentration, like a white paper disc or mm. a candle flame right. or whatever. You know, you could take the space between your hands as the object. There's a number, there's 10 of them. You can look yeah. up them up in the old text. But, you know, I was wondering why in, in these old books up here, like the Vasudhimaga and the Vimudhimaga and the um, Abhidhamma, do they go on and on and on about casina practice and all the wild stuff it can do? And nobody almost seems to do that anymore, except a few rare people. Bhante Gunaratana would talk about this. Pao Oksido talks about this a little bit, but it's very hard to find this training. And they yeah. were talking about it leading to powers and visions and realms and body stuff and healing uh -huh. and, and insights and deep jhanic states and all this stuff. And I was like, why is nobody teaching this stuff when they go for hundreds of pages in a time when writing would have been super expensive and time consuming? And yet uh -huh. they just go on and on and on about it. It's like, what is up with this? These people were clearly very excited about something and wanting to make sure it was preserved and transmitted. So mm -hmm. me and some of my friends started doing the experiment and redoing, you know, going back and looking at these practices. And sure enough, they lead to all the stuff they say they did. They weren't mm -hmm. making it up. Right. And right. so that's that's been really cool. That was also something that really got me. The empiricist side of Daniel, too, that likes reproducibility mm -hmm. is pretty intrigued by the fact that Daniel one found these recipes mm -hmm. and formulae and instructions written in books written 2000 plus years ago sometimes. You know, that that one's about 1500 years old. That one's about 2200 years old. That one's about 1900 years old. And then texts since then that say, hey, if you do these things, these things happen. And empirically, that's true. You just, you know, so the empiricist in Daniel 2 and the empiricist in Daniel 1 really get along. Like that you can follow instructions that they wrote down in terms of a technical set of experiment and it leads to the results. Okay, cool. Do Useful. you now have a, a kind of... Um all-encompassing um, metaphysics or or teleology that you no. could describe? No. In fact, I am a strict ontolog ontologically agnostic empirical empirical pragmatist. Uh -huh. I obviously, having you know read countless books on consciousness and spirituality and what is an ontology and the underlying you know structure of reality from every point of view you can imagine from all the variants of quantum physics and all its miscellaneous interpretations and you know to uh, you know, the, the weirdest spiritual stuff, Yogachara and Mahamudra and, you know, all these Nagarjuna and, and, you know, deep conversations and Descartes and, you know, all, you know, and the modern consciousness people and is what is consciousness? What is going on? I can see pros and cons to each of those various models. Mm -hmm. And I very loosely put on some of these hats when I'm trying to solve certain problems or relate to certain people around certain things for a specific outcome and then take them off just as quickly and hold none of them as sacrosanct personally. That doesn't mean I don't appreciate when people do. I do. Mm -hmm. And if it's useful for you to hold one of these as sacrosanct, fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. But I very much appreciate my materialist side as much as my cosmic consciousness side, as well as my sides that look at things through very sort of religious and divine and whatever lenses and very mysterious ones. So, okay. so I, I personally am pretty happy to have quite a wide palette to work with a wide range of situations. And I'm grateful for all the work of people who do this. I also don't think from an EPRC point of view that adopting any of those will scale because those debates are at least 2,800 years old. You can find from the dawn of the axial age, every right, single yeah. debate about these things. And from I'm a clinical doctory that. point of view, yeah. what I really care about is that clinicians have a very ontologically neutral set of phenomenological frames that will scale globally, stay out of the ontology wars and work as well in Riyadh, as Rome, as Reno, as rural Alabama, where I sit talking to you, as I've said on numerous podcasts before. What about um, your personal teleology? As in, um, do you have a sense of the kind of the, the point of life, the point of practice? 
I actually think questions of meaning are vastly harder than doing things like awakening. So awakening, straightforward, perceptual, you know, diagnosis. Is, this is a doable thing with straightforward technologies that don't need any teleological assumptions beyond things that you can derive from immediate empiricism in the David Humean sense. So, which is pretty teleologically light, I would say. And do I appreciate a wide range of teleologies? Yes. And do I have some of my own favorites? So functionally, when I actually look at like my functional like what is compelling to me in terms of meaning, uh, I personally get a lot of value out of service, out of sharing the journey, out of community, of trying to think about how to lend value to people and communities and the planet and my colleagues in various yeah. disciplines. That's very compelling to me. And something of the notion of service and giving back, I do all this as a volunteer. In fact, I pay to play, right? I'm retired. I don't need to do any of this. And yet I'm, I feel called. So that as a functional thing rather than an intellectual thing, I feel called to do this work to help the world relate to the deep end better, which has been so important for me and my friend circle. And that sense that's that provides a tremendous amount of day to day meaning for me because these experiences themselves have been intrinsically meaningful and intrinsically had a tremendous sense of relevance, regardless of any traditional overlay. Uh -huh, so so uh -huh. that if is a is a yeah. working set of functional meaning is what I find most compelling at the moment, rather than anything intellectual. So they're kind of you find these states intrinsically meaningful rather than necessarily, you know, like and therefore. Right. Yeah. OK. And uh, let's talk about, um, you know, going back to this idea of the big prize, what um, if someone's listening to this and that thinks that sounds great. Um, what should they do? That actually, unfortunately, is tends to be a very long conversation. I get people who reach out to me with that one pretty frequently. And as I say all the yeah. time, it's usually a 90 minute conversation to even scratch the surface of it. And you have to understand what a person is bringing into this, their aesthetics, their history, what they've tried and worked or didn't, what their goals are. And there's usually their stated goal and then their actual goals, where if you keep asking, yeah, but why do you want that? Why do you want that? If you do that long enough, you usually get to something much more mundane. Like, what are they trying to heal or solve? A lot of, I find a lot of people trying to solve real world problems with spiritual methods. I can understand the logic because having, you know, or emergent methods or whatever you want to call them, right? So, and yet uh, there's often off some very real world component where they're just like suffering after a breakup or they don't know what to do with their job or, you know, okay. So, so asking lots of questions about if they want to get started in this, make sure you've really had the time to help, you know, explore what's going on with you in terms of your real needs. Yeah. Um, you know, and then there's like, there's like people's strengths and weaknesses. Like some people are really strong in one sense store or strong in one technique. And yet they might be really weak on ego strength in the classic Freudian sense of looking at their dark stuff and not freaking out, you know, having a transformative process happen and staying functional in the face of that, or, you know, or they, they might be really bad at concentrating, but they're, they're really good at like, you know, living a good life and and really doing yeah. something functionally useful in their community, uh -huh. and so, and then then working with their goals and their their traditional practices. So, like, what's their relationship to orthodoxy? What's their relationship to hierarchy? What's their relationship to fancy hats and trappings and symbols? Or do they need something way less structured? What's their relationship to materialism versus non-materialism? How rationalist are they superficially, and how rationalist are they when you actually look at their deep core? Because some people there's a real gap there. And, and so, and then trying, you know, and then what's the risk tolerance, right? What are they, what are they willing to give up? Do they have like two kids and three jobs and they've got a ton of debt and they're taking care of their aging parents and they just can't take a lot of risks right now? Or are they like a 20 something year old trust a far eye kid, you know, who's willing to go out and, you know, they're, they're going to climb to the top of the mountain one way or the other. And as fast as they can, it's just a question of which of the hyper intense expedient paths might be the least dangerous and the most efficacious. Right. So like you get these really different you know, kind of risk profiles and, you know, what they want in terms of the intensity of it and what they think they can reasonably tolerate. And so this is not a straightforward question, unfortunately. It's really complicated. And I wish, it, a, I wish a, it was I mean, easy, but it isn't. Sure. But I mean, listening to you talk about it, I think what an incredible 90 minute conversation that will be, because you're basically, be, you would be in that a kind of spiritual career advisor. 
Yeah. As these are the different paths. These are the different practices. These are all the options. And well, that I know of, right? I'm, I'm, I'm limited. You know it's not of, like I because right. because because usually if you go to um a a spiritual expert for advice, they'll say, "Well, my tradition, my practice. Come and be a Russian Orthodox monk, do <laughs> yoga, uh, smoke DMT." You know, they 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 will offer their pra- their tradition. So that kind of uh, m- multi multiple you know bird's eye view is is very hard to come by. Oh, that is also true, but that's something I like. And then part of the experiment is how could the the medical profession have something of that? Because it's a real value. People are asking these questions these days. Wouldn't it be cool if you could go to your doctor and say, hey, here's who I am. You know me or your mental health provider. Should I do it again, a 10 day intensive meditation retreat or hmm. do a bunch of shrooms, you know, like yeah. and have it as an and have some integration days or whatever, or some MDMA or whatever it is, and have that have an honest, da- data driven conversation yeah. that wasn't all yeah. taboo and weird and me- like, yeah, wouldn't that be cool? I mean, it's, it's going to be yeah. decades if that ever happens, but but everybody, everybody like me out there who's doing this and hopefully not just trying to funnel everybody into their brand or product would like better data because I recognize the limitations of Daniel one data is through a skewed set of the people who come to me and what's worked for them, my own views, because even as I am not that orthodox, I've been influenced by orthodoxy, right? I've trained in very orthodox settings and number of traditions and, and, you know, and I, I don't have anything like, uh, you know, but I'm humble enough to know, I don't have anything like the full picture of what's out there, what's offered, who's offering it, nor do I really understand all the predisposing factors for good outcomes. One of the wilder things you see out there when you do this for long enough is you recognize that there are people who you're like, there's no way you should do intensive practice, dude. You're just not stable enough. And then they do it. And man, if they don't thrive and shine, that was exactly what they needed. And other people who you're like, no, you totally got this. You seem so stable, so put together, so whatever. And, and then like, they just shatter like a pane of glass in the in the face of whatever experiences they had. And it goes horribly. You know, what's going on there? Because I, everybody, if you've been doing this long enough, has seen that happen. And we just yeah. don't know. And we've got to admit, we can't perfectly predict what's going to be a good fit. And, and, but I, I would love better data. Is it genetic? Is it epigenetic? Is it like, was there something in family history that could predict this? Like, what are all the tools from Daniel two side that could help Daniel one yeah. figure out yeah. how we, how we can get a better fit with less risk and more benefit. And you said, you know, I'm trying to offer, uh, you know, I'm one of the people who's interested in learning and offering advice without trying to funnel people into my particular brand or content. I mean, that happens. I mean, it's not so- like I don't like my stuff. I say you could read yeah, chapter yeah, 30, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. I, I do, you know, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm giving it like, away. Like, your so, book like, is for free and so on. Right. Um, and, I, I, and it references tons of other books and traditions that are not, yeah. you know, stuff that I'm as, as core to. Right. And so um, what's your take on where kind of Western spirituality is now, uh, culturally, <laughs> historically? <laughs> and, and why is, okay, let me, let me, let me sharpen that up. Uh, <laughs> Do you get, why is there so much bullshit at the moment? You know, it's funny, as I look back in the history of bullshit, I actually have a a book on bullshit that was given to me by the chair of my residency, Dan Denzel in emergency medicine, because he thought I'd appreciate it. I think there's always been a staggering amount of bullshit, (laughs) right? So I don't think that's anything particularly new. There's, There's more information and data, but is the proportionality of it more bullshit, shitty? I don't even know. Like, but has there always been a tremendous amount? Yes, and that's why we need good science because science, yes, it can become scientific and it can become limited and it can be set up and interpreted to show certain results, right? It's not like science is a perfect tool, Mm. but do I think it has something to lend to this conversation that it hasn't lent so far and tremendous potential to lend to it? Yes, and why is there so much bullshit right now? Part of that is just the massive proliferation of the internet. Part of this is developmental, like, I think a tremendous amount of stuff I believed earlier in my life that I believe really hardcore then now I think is kind of bullshit, right? Like, ah, I, I was super into this. Nah, ah, no, not really. You know, and maybe there are things that in 20 years, I'll look back and 54 year old Daniel and go, he was so full of shit, right? <laughs> That's entirely possible. And so part of the smart be developmental. And then the question is with, with you, you run into this weird tension of like, it takes a long time to really develop wisdom and discernment and a sense of what's out there. But now things are moving so fast that it's hard to simultaneously be an older person who is yet learning enough stuff to keep up with what you need to relate to that wis- that wisdom to in a skillful way. 
that sort of future shock that future shock of fast moving technology and conversations, I think is creating this weird gap where older people who do have a level of discernment that takes decades to develop, and we need to honor that, are having a hard time keeping up with how fast the conversations are moving. It is definitely true that conversations are moving faster than they ever were. And so in some ways, I think part of that is just making them more unhinged, less tried, less refined, more raw, um, also right. more tremendous creative potential. You know, it's like it's like a tremendous, just just tremendous amounts of manure being blasted and all over everything. It's very deinstitutionalized, connected right. to this internet spirituality. Yeah, and I haven't said anything particularly profound there, but I'm very much worried about the sort of gap of older people who are not able to keep up with younger people's conversations in the way, whereas that wouldn't have been true 100 years ago in the same kind of way or two, 200, 500 years ago. And yeah. so I, that does concern me because even as I recognize, do I think I have a lot more wisdom about the EPRC project than I did four years ago when I started it? I feel like I've kind of done a PhD in this over mm -hmm. the last four years. And so I think I know a lot. And I'm going to guess in 10 years, I'm going to look back on what I know now and go, oh my, you're so <laughs> naive, <laughs> you know? And and so how do we, how do we, how do we pull in the wisdom of people who have been around a lot longer and seen that? you know, wrestled with these issues a lot deeper. And that's part of what the Expert Opinion Project is. These people right. with a lot of gray hair who have really right. thought deeply about this and lived it for decades, you know, some right. half a century. You know, yeah. how, how do we get their wisdom as part of this conversation? So $300,000, please, anybody, yeah. this is not a big ask to do something super profound for the world. Come on, philanthropists. Help us out. And and then we need some money for the EPRC, right? You asked me what I would do with a million dollars. I only got to 400,000 of it, right? Uh, we would do, the EPRC itself needs some money to run. We need lawyers and accountants and administrator people to just administer grants and aggregate funds and fundraise. We need some money. And and then there's a few other studies that we, we could debate, which of the other ones, stuff about stages of insight and jhanas, the neurophenomenology we're doing at Harvard is highly impactful. We've got a number of other people like Rosalind McAlpine and Chris Timmerman could use some more funding for their fundamental psychedelic, you know, phenomenology in neuroscience research. Um, there's a bunch of other very good candidates. So if, if you've got interest in us, please check out the eprc.org, um, check out ebenefactors.org, look at what we're asking for, help us out. If you have skills to lend, perspectives, network connections we should make, or money to give, please come help us out, help us help Jules to administer his grant and support him and his work and fundraise for him. Help, you know, help us help the whole space. If you care anything about any of this stuff, let us know, reach out to us, we're here for you. Um, info at the EPRC.org or info at ebenefactors.org. Thank you. Brilliant, Daniel. Thanks so much. Well, you, we can we can end there and end, end the recording there. Cool. All right. Let's see here. Thanks. <laughs>